what we are seeing is an old hatred with a new playbook. You had the Bellingham riots in the state of Washington. You fast forward to the 1980s and you had the horrific uh, dot buster gangs that were terrorizing uh, the Hindu community in New Jersey. Uh, now, interestingly, hate crimes against Hindu as Hindus as a specific category wasn't actually even recorded by the FBI until 2015. Even among the Indian community, there is a tendency to say, why are you making this about religion as a reaction to that video? And my question was, what else can I say when the attacker is pretty much going on and on and saying, you know, dirty Hindu, dirty Hindu, using cow piss and other tropes? How exactly can you pretend that this is anything uh, but religion. Hello, a very good evening. A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching Swarajya Conversations with me, Sharan Sethi. Today, I'm really privileged to be joined by uh, Samir Kalra and Pushpita Ji. Uh, both are from KONA, which is Coalition of Hindus of North America and Hindu American Foundation. Thank you so much, Pushpita, Samir, and uh, we have Ujwal from Swarajya. A very good evening to you and a good morning to you both. Good morning. Namaste. Thanks so much for having me. Namaste. Great to be here. Namaste. Great to have you here. Uh, I, I wish we could have had this chat uh, on a little more positive premise, but unfortunately, we are seeing a huge resurgence uh, in terms of the attacks that are done on Hindus across the world and I think America has been in the news as well. So uh, is this, I mean obviously we've seen isolated incidents in the past and perhaps after 2014 uh, even with the Republicans coming to power there is a sense of semblance in the media that we need to pay a lot of attention to these matters because they are racially, ethnically or even religiously motivated for that matter but would you say that this is a continuation of a trend that has been already preset or is it just that there is a awakening in the Hindu community that yes we need to start paying attention to these crimes and I'll open this up to uh, the both of you maybe Pushpita ji can join uh, can start and then Sami can add on. Sure um, I think uh, you said it very correctly there has been a resurgence but this Hindu phobia predates any current dispensation whether it's in the US or India and if you look at it, uh, in July, there was this uh, really groundbreaking research that came out from Rutgers University Network Contagion Research Institute. And uh, I'm sure you've seen it. I know you guys have talked to the authors. Uh, but I think one of the things that struck me in the foreword from the former Attorney General of New Jersey was this phrase that he used that what we are seeing is an old hatred with a new playbook. Uh, so hate against Hindus is a very old problem. Um, including right here in the US. So I think it is very, very important to keep that framework in mind as we look at all the incidents uh, that we are facing. And uh, the Hindu community really needs to wake up to the fact that, you know, they're always surprised. Why, why, what happened? What's the hatred? And, you know, just have to realize it's there. It's not going away. So learn how to deal with it. Right. I don't mean to trivialize uh, this issue when I say this, but when we hear about gun violence in America and other racially motivated crimes, uh, hate crimes that happen, uh, do you think that there is a sense of feeling in other communities when they hear the term Hindu phobia, perhaps it's being amplified more than what it actually needs to be treated as, as perhaps a normal hate crime. And obviously I'm thinking from a different perspective so that we can address that concern as well. So is this just another hate crime or is this actually targeted and Hindus need to be a little concerned about this summit. Sure. So if I may, just to step back for one moment, um, you know, just talking about hate violence against the Hindu community. I mean, we can, first of all, go back to the early 1900s and some of the anti-Hindu, anti-Indian laws that were instituted in the country, particularly states like Washington, um, in California. You had the Bellingham riots in the state of Washington. You fast forward to the 1980s and you had the horrific uh, dot buster gangs that were terrorizing uh, the Hindu community in New Jersey. Uh, now, interestingly, hate crimes against Hindu as Hindus as a specific category wasn't actually even recorded by the FBI until 2015 when there was an initiative 
by HEF and a number of other civil rights organizations to add uh, specific categories to the tracking by the FBI of uh, hate violence. So there was an anti-Sikh category, anti-Hindu category, anti-Buddhist, anti-Arab category that was added. So the violence has definitely been there. The anti-Hindu hate has definitely been there. It's being recorded more recently uh, better, um, but it's still not being recorded properly. Um, that deals with, number one, the fact that law enforcement agencies aren't really aware of what Hindu phobia looks like or what anti-Hindu violence look like, looks like. And I think to push Pushpata's point, that report does a great job of helping to lay out what Hindu phobia actually is and what it encompasses. Um, and if you look at how other communities are uh, viewing some of the recent violence, I think it's it's not that they may look at this as lesser than, I think they just haven't been aware of it. Um, and there have been killings, uh, murders of, um, of Hindus. Srinivas Kuchibotla a few years ago was killed in Kansas. So we see violence uh, committed, severe violence committed against Hindus and a track record of that. Uh, so I wouldn't say that, you know, people view it as less than. I think they just not are not as aware of it um, and, and how it's happening. I, I think the other thing to point out is that there's a difference uh, now. What we're seeing is that there's a perception that anti-minority violence is always committed by whites or white nationalists or extreme on the American right, extremists on the American right. But what we're seeing now is there's a trend of violence being committed from those that are within the larger Indian subcontinental diaspora. So the Khalistani groups have become more active. Both the Queen's Temple attack as well as the Fremont incident were committed um, ostensibly by pro-Khalistani activists. So that's, I think, another important trend to keep in mind in terms of how the violence, what we see of the violence today. This is extremely interesting because um, in terms of our national security studies, if we were to look at the threat perception to India from uh, different insurgent groups which are residing outside of India, say North America alone, I think the government tracks and monitors the active threats that India receives from, say, Khalistani groups that are based in Canada. But we never acknowledge the crimes that diaspora Hindus actually face in places like America, right, from those own groups. So do you think that there is um, not much awareness, in, even in India for that matter, about some of the crimes that actually happen in America from, uh, you know, from, from the so-called South Asian community themselves? Pushpita. Absolutely. Um, and not only is there a lack of awareness, even when incidents happen, there is outright denial or attempts to turn it back into racism uh, or something that feels comfortable. So I had a chat with Krishnan uh, just a couple of days ago and we shared some of the comments that he was receiving, you know, even after his extremely horrific video that sort of, I mean, I don't know which thinking person could look at that video and ascribe any This is the Taco Bell video you're referring to. This right? is the person in Fremont, right. the California Taco Bell, just down the road from both Samir and myself. And uh, it's pretty shocking, but even among the Indian community, there is a tendency to say, why are you making this about religion as a reaction to that video? And my question was, what else can I say when the attacker is pretty much going on and on and saying, you know, dirty Hindu, dirty Hindu, using cow piss and other tropes? How exactly can you pretend that this is anything uh, but religion? And then how can it be racism when, you know, everyone's from the same race? So I think this incident is so important because in a lot of the other incidents, you don't get these very clear cut distinctions. So people quickly try to paper it over, trying to say, well, it's anti-racism, it's anti-Indian hate. And of course, both of those exist. I mean, the fact that there is specific anti-Hindu hate, uh, people sort of see it as a zero sum game, right? That if I exist, that re uh, Hindu hate exists, uh, I am going to deny that there is racism, which is a silly yeah. way to look at it. Because you can have, yeah. you have a lot of racism just based on skin color. You can have hatred based on country of origin and you, you can and do have uh, hatred based on religion too. So I think that piece is very important for the community to re recognize, for lawmakers, law enforcement, and actually for the Indian government too. And we see it all the time, this uh, 
this desire, especially I think Indians are very guilty of it. Uh, this desire to always sort of, especially for the diaspora community, to always suppress everything as Indian. And again, we are all multiple identities, right? Uh, we are of Indian origin. We have a certain faith. Uh, we are a certain skin color. We are part of certain work communities. We are part of regional communities right here in the U.S. Uh, but there is this tendency in India to boil us down to being nothing but, you know, diaspora Indians. And I think that is also part of the problem that, you know, the, the religious aspect gets buried in it. I remember having this very interesting conversation with Suhag Shukla the last time uh, uh, she and I had a conversation and basically we arrived at a point where we were sort of going through the popular literature, popular culture and how it represents a lot of these uh, stereotypes of India and South Asia in general. And many of the stars today without taking any names, if you look, look at the biggest stars on Netflix and Disney and on Amazon, most of them belong to the quote-unquote South Asian community and uh, many of them even acknowledge Islamophobia as a concept, right? Now, I don't have a problem if somebody from the Muslim community says, hey, look, after the, after the war on terror was declared, there's a lot of hate crimes against Muslims happening because we belong to a certain ethnicity. But my question is, why do you snatch away the agency from Hindus as a community? I mean, even they can, they are people too, they're not Martians, even they can be targeted. So do you believe that the community, um, you know, that represents uh, South Asia in popular culture has actually denounced this and ignored this for a very long time, Samir? Sure. So first of all, I have to um, say that I dislike the term South Asian. I know it's uh, it's a popular term and South Asia. I hate the term, the too, geographic but, you know, just for the sake of conversation. Uh, of course, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, and we still have to use it, unfortunately. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is what it is. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think there was actually a perfect comparison that was done um, between how in South Asian pop culture um, and some of these shows, how a show about um, Muslims, and this is that uh, superhero show, I forgot the name of it, about a Muslim American girl, Pakistani, of Pakistani origin, and then the show Never Have I Ever about an Indian Hindu girl, and how those two shows are such contrast because the one about a Muslim Pakistani does such a great job of sensitizing issues for the Muslim community and presenting them in a very positive light and also talking positively about her Muslim culture, her faith, her traditions. On the other hand, Never, ha Never Have I Ever almost trivializes uh, being Hindu. And, um, you know, there, it, instead of talking about the beauty, the, the nuances, the pluralistic nature of the tradition, it just kind of turns it into a caricature of Hinduism. So I, it is definitely present. Unfortunately, I think the fault lies on these uh, actors, these uh, you know production companies themselves, and it's coming from the community. It's coming from us as Hindus, some who are in Hindu in name only, or some that are identify more South Asian. They are the ones responsible for trivializing, trivializing their own identities and always not either not wanting to recognize that these issues are there and not wanting to portray their culture positively, uh, or just focusing on issues that are affecting Muslims or talking about Islamophobia. So I think it's it's present. And unfortunately, the, the fault lies with our own community itself. And those that are in those positions right. to actually do something about it are not taking the opportunity to. I remember just about a year ago when I was talking about this issue, um, when I was with a different platform, uh, the debate was all about to get Americans uh, to recognize that, you know, swastika is not what is associated with uh, Nazi Germany and that that was the big movement in America because you know people were, were generally confused and this is not merely because of people's uh, people being unaware or being misinformed but rather it is deliberate disinformation by certain people in certain universities uh, this is some sort of a, a left academic nexus that happens globally that is also connected with India so uh, would you say, Ujwal, that this is some sort of a global nexus that has certain repercussions that we've not been able to sort of track yeah, and so for a very long time? What I believe is that as Dharma it itself represents the one unfinished project, as a lot of people say that we are the one last remaining pagan civilization in the world. It represents so in a world where the world has been washed over either by one faith or one of the two Abrahamic faiths. At that time, Hinduism represents the one lasting civilization that has lasted over thousands of years and still 
is an is a living breathing civilization so what it represents is an unfinished project and therefore a lot of forces on all the sides are clamping down on it to somehow be able to fasten the project now because they haven't been able to do that so a lot of tools are being put in place so you have academia that is coming in so they say that hinduism isn't exactly a religion it's actually nothing it is just a lot of individual religions and therefore there's nothing that uh, there's no such thing as hindu phobia they'll tell you so they'll essentially be very much uh, active about it and vocal about uh, hate against christians or hate against muslims but when it comes to hindus they're divided into groups that this is hate against one group of hindus or the other so first of all that hindu unity is not uh, ever made a reality and other than that academia jumps in because it just becomes a point you know and a point of good academic research that it shows you off as more sophisticated and more open minded that you're just against uh, speaking against uh, speaking in favor of these um, let's say uneducated people that you know who don't know what their interests are and therefore the academia will jump in with the whole leftist nexus and then the ngos jump into the whole thing that we are essentially going to so, so the proselytization project mixed with the education project mixed with the the ngos jumping in and they are getting their funding from abroad who are essentially seeing that india is a very you know fertile ground to essentially spread unrest and ngos can be great handmaidens to do that so ultimately all of this just combines and hindus are you know that agency is snatched yeah. away from them like you said where we cannot even open our minds and open our mouths to say that there is something wrong that is happening with our community yeah it it's very interesting because uh, the crackdown on certain ngos began uh, way before 4 5 years ago but today you see a lot of think tanks to being interconnected with politics and certain social and political organizations um but uh, when we talk about hate crimes directed towards uh, hindu communities and indians in general in america is there a certain demography or or a particular region that it's spread out in or it's th- throughout you know i've just been very curious about it pushpita ji if you could explain where exactly it happens or is it region specific or it's just spread out i am not i think we see it where you'd expect to like where you find clusters of the indian and the hindu community and in just the last couple of years i mean um you you like we saw some horrific signs last year come up in atlanta right where uh, people actually plastered the neighborhood uh, with these signs that were very reminiscent of the dot busters uh, basically saying no hindus and no to the bindi and then uh, we've seen repeated attacks for example the statues of mahatma gandhi right um, he is one of the most visibly uh, hindu figures known in the west and unfortunately for his statues sit out in places where they're not super protected i mean even temples get attacked of course uh, we've seen lots of attacks in in canada in new york um, in other parts of the country but the statues just sit out there where without any protection and they are a very good barometer i think of the hate Uh, that is rising in the society because you know um gandhi statues have been attacked in davis sacramento new york canada i'm sure there are other places i don't have an exhaustive list so i think you'll see them wherever um indian and hindu communities live and i think that's why all of those communities need to be on watch but then they happen in odd places too right like mm. uh the gentleman samir mentioned the guy who was shot uh, he was not in a place we normally think of as him having a big indian community so institutions wherever they are and then individuals honestly wherever they are too and as far as the legislations are concerned um, i do see a lot of um, congressmen speaking up about this or at least trying to represent the cause maybe there there is a certain amount of electoral benefit for them but uh, you know uh, keeping that aside in terms of laws being passed to protect the community um, what do we as a community have so far samir sure so you know I, i think on a positive note there has been quite a bit of outrage in general uh, to what the recent incidents at least to the recent incidents that have occurred and there have been statements some later <laughs> than others but uh, they came out nonetheless um you know condemning the recent incidents and the anti-hindu violence which is which is positive which is good and not just at the federal level but local state level as well um beyond the statements so i think when we look at legislation i think a lot of the legislation is going to be more broad based in terms of strengthening hate crimes protections 
But in those pieces of legislation, what we can do and what we are trying to do, particularly at the state level, is to add uh, additional information about what hate crimes can look at look like against the Hindu American community. So what are common symbols of Hindus that may be attacked? We were working on a, um, a bill in California, for instance, a hate crimes bill, and we were adding language in there about what hate crimes against the Hindu community would look like just as other communities were doing uh, the same for their communities. So I think laws can be strengthened. They need to be strengthened. A lot of this is going to happen at the state level. Um, legislatively, more can get done at the state level uh, than at the federal level. We all know Congress is uh, can be quite dysfunctional, um, not just when it comes to issues we're dealing with, but I think across the board, uh, and as well as actually working with law enforcement separately. So whether that's the Department of Justice at the federal level or whether that's local law enforcement agencies district attorney's offices, it all needs to be done in conjunction. So legislation is one part of it. The other part of it is working with these um, other agencies to make sure that they have proper training materials um, a, a around hate crimes um, and what hate crimes against the Hindu community looks like, um, but then training the community too. So bringing in these agencies to work and educate the community. What's the difference between a bias incident versus an actual hate crime? Right. So for if there's something that may be anti-Hindu in nature, it may not rise to the level of a hate crime. Um, but that needs to be our community needs to be educated about the differences, but that they should still report anything that occurs, even if it's not a necessarily a hate crime, but it's a bias incident, because we need to track that because a bias incident today could turn into a hate crime tomorrow. Um, so it, it, I think it, it, the work needs to be done at all levels and going back to the schools as well, right? We, there's a continuum starts with bullying in schools can escalate yeah. into anti-Hindu, uh, hate, hate speech, and at its worst level, uh, turns into a hate crime. And that bullying- Have there been incidents of that specifically where in college or schools, people have been targeted because of their Hindu origins? Absolutely. And it happens at the K through 12 level. It happens at the university level. Universities have become very unsafe spaces uh, for Hindu Americans. K through 12 schools oftentimes have curriculum that perpetuates uh, stereotypes uh, and propaganda, anti-Hindu propaganda. Um, oftentimes uh, teachers themselves uh, may be teaching in a way that leads to bullying of students. So it has to be, a, I think, a multi-pronged approach that addresses all of these different areas. Um, I, I, I have a follow-up question for you, but I'll just quickly move on to Ujwal and then I'll revert in a minute. Um, Ujwal, you know, whenever we see um, any power rising, um, geopolitically speaking, there's usually some sort of phobia involved against such communities. Today, if you look at the literature in China, um, a major portion of it, the keyword is Sinophobia. I mean, we don't acknowledge that because we don't have a lot of Chinese citizens residing in India. Uh, but that is a major part of the discourse. Uh, for instance, even during the uh, Russian Ukraine war, Russophobia has, uh, you know, be uh, has become very popular as a term in many of the state owned media houses in Russia. So perhaps India has also been um, rising as a power globally and not just in the subcontinent. Do you see a, a certain parallel or a connection? To these, you know, increase in hate crimes against Hindus related to India's, uh, you know, rise in the global stage or perhaps. Yeah, so it, uh, it's not just very recent, you know, even 70, 80 years back when Pearl Harbor incident happened, suddenly there was this rising hatred against the Japanese in America. So the Americans were just sitting pretty out of the Second World War and all of a sudden a country comes and bombs one of their biggest harbors and suddenly all the Japanese who were living in America were all shifted to internment camps their properties were taken away so uh, it just happened now that is the first thing that it just happens over the time because when the world or anybody at large is used to you know let uh, let's say a bully is used to somebody being a victim constantly so you're supposed to be meek you're supposed to surrender and now you're not surrendering you're flexing your muscles so of course the people who've been in power who who are used to seeing you as the proverbial dead horse you can you can just keep flogging endlessly and there will be no reaction and now suddenly you're starting to stand up for yourself, they will get uncomfortable about it. Now, as far as Hindu phobia is concerned, you know, even in your premise, you mentioned post-2014. Now, a lot of it has to do with the fact that there was a massive political change in 2014, which was also supplemented by the rise of social media. Now, you can either call Mr. Modi's rise being, uh, you know, propelled by social media or social media 
and it, it's it's just a reinforcing cycle we can uh, not get the starting point of it either way the hindu community which was till now you know constantly suppressed and shamed within india that you have um, barbaric traditions and you are uncivilized people suddenly we are starting to speak up for ourselves we are starting to see that we are not going to look at ourselves from your lens from the western point of view we are going to look at ourselves from our standards our own viewpoint and suddenly when the hindu community starts speaking up you have the size of uh, the phrase called muscular hindu nationalism that this of fascist hindu forces are on the rise whereas all the hindus are doing is all they are saying is that look you keep a standard to yourself we'll we'll take care of ourselves we don't want your judgment we don't want we're not it's not like we are judging your traditions it's not like we are questioning you on your belief so why don't you extend the same courtesy to us so like you just said you know people are just used to seeing us in that uh, as a weak uh, player on the ground and suddenly if you start uh, you know rising up and standing up for yourself people the powers that we do start to score people they will of course feel challenged and then they'll come out come at you from all directions so they'll come at you with as in your religious beliefs yeah. are bad or your you know academically you're not quite there so all of those things happen but i think hindus will ultimately stand up for their interest everywhere it is happening in india against Christian missionaries, or uh, you know, Sir Tansir Jodha, it's happening even in India. It's happening in America. It's happening everywhere. It will just take time, but it is already unfolding. So I'm hopeful. Sameer just mentioned, uh, summarized the history of Hindu phobia, perhaps from the 90s, and uh, it was it was very uh, eye-opening because uh, I didn't know, know a lot of the things that you actually mentioned. Um, and if we look at the history of um, you know hatred, hate crimes towards certain communities. Uh, even the Chinese. I mean, now it's very popular that uh, certain Chinese people of Chinese origin are targeted, even in America, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and all of that. But even during the railroads when they were being built, there was an actual hatred driven to, towards uh, you know people from China. And I think these episodes keep on recurring in history. But uh, has that happened with the Hindu community, or is it more of a recent phenomenon, uh, Pushpita? I. didn't quite understand the is hindu hatred new or yes yeah, I mean, it's it's more contemporary or it is, does it go you know much more yeah i think to the history i want to just point out one thing before we get into incidents right so i mean forget history i would like to point out that even today um there is a massive massive undercounting of what counts as hindu hatred um my favorite thing is if you type the word hindu phobia into your google doc or microsoft it's going to give you a like a little red squiggly line which means it's not even still recognized as a word despite the enormity of the crimes we see happening right here before us and despite indians being uh dominant in the tech industry and running both google and microsoft uh they're both run by hindus yet hindu phobia is not a valid word so i don't think you have to delve very fast and far in history um the radcliffe report that i mentioned at the beginning they also pointed that out that despite the massive volume of anti hindu hate that they saw and they were shocked to kind of track uh they were surprised to see how it is largely uh dismissed not discussed or denied and we know there is an active lobby uh, of uh, south asia or uh, academics and indology departments that basically make a living out of denying hindu phobia exists calling it a political term and even downplaying hindu persecution you know the kind of blatant flat out persecution we see in uh, outside india right pakistan bangladesh even that is denied last year 2021 was the 50th anniversary of the bengali hindu genocide i think it's the largest uh, episode of genocide the world has seen since the holocaust what remembrance did you see about it you know what did we we saw very little to mark such a such a solemn occasion and such a massive loss of life so i think um, we can look at history but i am more interested in the present and i am also more interested in how to tackle this going forward uh, but yes going back to your history comment um i think uh, there is there is a natural tendency to have hatred against the other that unfortunately is part of the way human beings are constructed so certainly you can see a lot of um hindu immigration and indian immigration to the us dates back to well over a century uh, even though most of us tend to think of it as happening in the 80s and 90s and um there there has been some interesting incidents where uh people from india hindus and others were kind of denied certain uh immigration statuses visa statuses because of at that point it was 
called race, but there was a time when all Indians immigrating to the U.S. were just called Hindus, H-I-N-D-O-O-S, you know, so everyone was a Hindu. Uh, and there's actually a very interesting Twitter handle called Hindu History that tracks a lot of the hate. Yeah, it's uh, a very that, fascinating handle. Yeah, and if you look at the if you look at the images that you he pulls out from the uh, from the cartoons and the uh, publications that are 100 120 years old you start to see the threads are very similar you know the way they're talking about hindus as uh, you know uh, dirty, suspicious, idol worshippers. Uh, they're coming here to take your women. Uh, you know, all these threats, they haven't gone away that much. They're just sort of updated. So the old hatred in a new playbook is uh, what I'd bring out again. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Samir, before we wrap up, uh, would you like to say something about what's the action plan going forward? Because I'm, I'm sure um, right now there is a sense of awakening in a lot of uh, the Hindus and Hindu communities in particular, and uh, there is an action-oriented approach being sought by many of the groups that represent Hindu causes like yours. Uh, so, you know, uh, do you work in tandem? And if, if you do, then, you know, what's the commonality in terms of, um, you know, how you want to go forward about all of these things? Sure. Uh, so I think, as you mentioned, unfortunately, there are certain incidents that do awaken the community. If we look at DGH last year, uh, I think that was another key incident perpetuating Hinduphobia where people got galvanized around that issue. Similarly, this recent streak of hate crimes, I think, is something that is definitely galvanizing the Hindu community. And it's great to see many organizations, many activists in the community coming forward to do a lot of great work on this issue. Um, we'll I'll try to work together when we can, but even if we're not, I think we're all working in the same direction and working to help protect uh, the Hindu American community and educate the broader American society, uh, whether uh, the public, policymakers, the media, uh, law enforcement, schools, et cetera, about some of these issues. Um, so I think that is positive. And I, I think I'm definitely hopeful in terms of um, you know how the community is moving forward. In terms of what we need to do, I think, again, it's multi-pronged. Um, I think it starts at, at the school level, is making sure that textbook curriculum is accurate and balanced in how they depict uh, Hindus, Hinduism, and India. Um, it's working on issues and bullying um, with, within the classroom. It goes to the college level and trying to do a lot of work at the university level, making sure that Hindu American students have a safe environment to work in, uh, sorry, to study in. Um, and beyond that, in the pri private sector, in corporations, we see a number of caste policies, unfortunately, being trying, you know, attempts to implement those at the corporate level and in other spaces at the university level. So making sure that we're working in those spaces as well to deal with that, because caste, these, uh, quote unquote, caste based discrimination policies are just nothing more than another form of Hindu phobia. Um, it's a way to target the Hindu American community, target, keep them, treat them se uh, separately, suspiciously, um, and saying that you as a group of people are so horrible that you need a separate set of laws and policies just to police, to be policed just for you. Not that general American laws should apply to you just like they apply to everybody, but you need a separate set of laws. Uh, so I think that is another aspect of it. Then it's going back to working with law enforcement um, and educating them about these issues, uh, policymakers. Um, at the policy level, I think, you know, local and state is, I think, is where the focus needs to be. Because at the end of the day, what the, the policies that affect our lives daily are happening at the local and state levels. So I think as a community, we need to be much more active at those levels uh, to work towards protecting the better protecting the community, better protecting our institutions and combating issues like kinophobia. And you also create momentum. The more places you can get these issues recognized at the local and state level, it trickles up, so to speak, um, and then can impact federal and national policy as well. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that wonderful summary of it. Uh, in fact, uh, let me open up the same question to the both of you, Utval and Pushpita, and then pro probably we'll uh, close with that. Yeah, I would say that, you know, in addition to everything Samir said, the community, we need to start with our own kids. It needs to start with Hindu parenting. And uh, we actually run a effort specially focused on that. 
uh, Hindu parents need to understand what's going on. And then they need to make sure that they prep their kids to face what lies ahead for them. There is a massive amount of ignorance and I would say even denial among the community. Um, I'll just, uh, so I think it starts at home. Let your kids know, talk to your kids about what's, you know, your faith, your background. I always challenge people that, you know, if you did a poll of Hindu American teenagers, you will find massive, massive levels of disinterest to outright hostility. And that is not a um, aberration that has come about as a result of certain choices the community has made and continues to make. And it, the problem is going to get worse unless we make it better. And I think that's why an organization like Kona was created, because we found that there were seventh graders, like sixth and seventh graders coming home to their parents just with some abhorrent uh, worksheets from their teachers. And they didn't, and the parent would be just flabbergasted, not knowing what to do. Uh, because if you're a parent with a school system and you don't know where to begin when you have a, you, you tell your te child to trust the teacher, but if the teacher co comes up with something completely bizarre, you're at a loss to know what to begin. And so I think a platform like Kona, basically that was what we were created is like, you have to become, it has to become a grassroots effort. It has to become everybody's problem and everybody needs to get engaged and take action and also prepare our own kids to uh, face what's next. And I cannot stress the point of local engagement. We tend to focus on senators and Congress people, but in the last two months, for example, in the state of California, I met with the offices of like 40 state lawmakers, state senators and assembly people and I was shocked to know that about 90, 90, 90% of them did not know that swastika was a symbol that was sacred to Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain communities. That level of ignorance baffled me because these are people whose job it is to go out there and understand what their constituents uh, care about. These are not like, I wasn't talking to tech bros in San Francisco or something, right? That level of ignorance I could understand. So the, the more quiet we are, the worse we make this problem for ourselves. We all need to speak up. So oh, yeah, that's something very interesting that you mentioned because we are usually so focused on Hindu as the keyword. And obviously it's very accommodative when we say that. Uh, do these hate crimes also happen against other Indic religions such as, you know, for, for the Jain community or the Buddhists in America? I think they're too small. I mean, I, I, they have been attacks on, uh, b b yeah. uh, but I think some of the, like, uh, Jain, it was funny, right? Again, some of the lawmakers, they were like, what is a Jain? There was a pretty shocking level of ignorance. <laughs> so I think they consider the mandirs, like the Jain temple is just seen as some, and again, that's, I'm not saying, I'm not saying it is that way. I'm just saying what I heard is that yeah, it's a, a lot of ignorance. Yeah. Yes, a lot of ignorance. Uh, Ujwal, uh, first of all, a huge shout out to all the work that uh, Kona and uh, HAF is doing. Since I've been interacting with a lot of uh, representatives from your organizations, I personally, at least I'm aware of 10 to 15 percent of the work that all of you all have been doing. And it's really amazing. And I feel that it's really underrated. And even in India, there's not a lot of awareness as to how our community is globally fighting a similar war. But we are all soldiers who are not aware that we are in this battle together. Uh, Ujwal, your final words and then we'll close. Yeah, so what I'm, uh, I'll just say is that when you're living with, let's say, in your own country, so there's always that level of affinity that you have with everybody. But when you move abroad, of course, there's going to be that difference between who the majority is and then you'll be reduced to a minority. I mean, in that sense, it is very important for communities to you know, essentially mobilize and come together because it provides comfort and also safety. So what I've seen, you know, just living here and hearing about all this is that the Hindu community in America particularly has been, you know, of course, it is the the most successful community in America when you look at uh, the migrants there. But that is essentially because the Hindu community traditionally has kept their heads low and just gone about their jobs, become successful in life. But now because that hatred is on the rise, all the more political mobilization becomes important that you start, you know, actually... If, even if you look at Donald Trump when he was the president and Prime Minister Modi went there, the Howdy, uh, the Howdy Modi event, and then the Namaste Trump event that happened in India. And now if you look at the latest interview that Donald Trump has given, the Hindu community is mobilizing and the Indian American community is mobilizing. And it is a good sign because now they are in a position that even if there are politicians that are, that are actively wooing them, 
then just like the Jewish community or the Muslim community or let's say the Latin community, even the Hindu community can extract their interests uh, in return for that. But for that, the Hindus ha will have to speak up and like we have some Asian push with our G these organizations, they will have to align with these organizations if they want themselves to be safe and even their interests to be protected. Otherwise, you're you know living in a country which is essentially ethnically not yours, so you'll always they'll always be looking at you with that level of distrust or let's say the other. So you'll have to mobilize and protect your interests. That's the only way. Be it in this country or any other country, it always happens. In fact, uh, what we'll do is we'll put a link in the description below to both Kona and uh, HF uh, websites. And in case somebody is not aware about what they do and how much you can benefit from it personally, because a lot of the literature that uh, I read about Hinduphobia came from both of these websites. Before that, I had very minimal understanding uh, about these subjects. And I think everybody in general who cares about Indians as a community living abroad has to read this. Um, Ushpita ji, Samir ji, and Ujwal, thank you so much for giving us your time today. And it's uh, extremely heartwarming and enlightening to talk to all of you. And I hope uh, we can all connect once again in the future to have a conversation. Thank you thank so you much for having, for having us. us. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, ladies and gentlemen, do let us know what you thought about this conversation in the comment section below and do check out the link in the description. We'll be adding a lot of our resources over there. And until next time, this is your host, Shahan Sati, signing off.